Luke chapter number 17, begin reading, verse number 20. And what he was demanded of the Pharisees when the kingdom of God should come, he answered and said unto them, The kingdom of God cometh not with observation. Neither shall they say, Lo here or lo there, for behold, the kingdom of God is within you. And he said unto the disciples, The days will come when ye shall desire to see one of the days of the Son of Man, and ye shall not see it. And they shall say unto you, See here or see there, go not after them, nor follow them. For as the lightning that lighteneth out of the one part of the heaven shineth unto the other part under heaven, so shall also the Son of Man be in his day. But first must he suffer many things and be rejected of this generation. And as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be also in the days of the Son of Man. They did eat, they drank, they married wives, they were given in marriage until the day that Noah entered into the ark and the flood came and destroyed them all. Likewise also was it in the days of Lot. They did eat, they drank, they bought, they sold, they planted, they built it. But the same day that Lot went out of Sodom, it rained fire and brimstone from heaven and destroyed them all. Even thus shall it be in the day when the Son of Man is revealed. And that day he which shall be upon the housetop and, the stuff, and his stuff in the house, let him not come down to take it away. And he that is in the field, let him likewise not return back. Remember Lot's wife. Now, in this description, we hear not a description of the rapture. This is a description of the second coming of Christ. This is when Christ physically comes back, sets foot upon the earth. The return of Christ for his chosen people. Okay, we can also find an account of this over in the book of Matthew. Right, that was the epistle written to the Jews. But in this depiction, we see the culmination, if you will, of the great tribulation period. This is where Jesus comes back, sets it all right. But, verse number 20, the only reason he started talking about it says what he was demanded of the Pharisees. That, isn't that like the legalist crowd? We want to know and we want to know now. So he gives them an answer and they can't even wrap their head around it. How do you figure that, Brother Jordan? Because there's people who still can't wrap their head around it today. Right, he spoke in part because they demanded an answer, but until we get the explanation to the disciples... I don't see where he told everybody else to go away in verse number 22. It just says, and he said unto the disciples. They didn't get the answer they wanted, so they left, the Pharisees. It says, and then he said to the disciples, well, here's the rest of the story. Pharisees weren't interested in the rest of the story. They were looking for the answer that they wanted. But he tells them, he says, the kingdom of God cometh not with observation. For truly, the kingdom of God he says in verse number 21, Behold, the kingdom of God is within you. Too many people focused on when the Lord's coming back, they're not looking for what the Lord left. The Lord left the kingdom of heaven. What's that? That's your salvation that's supposed to spread to other salvation. The kingdom of heaven cannot be observed with mortal eyes. There was a time when Adam and Eve could look up and behold God seated on his throne in the heavens. But Jesus says that's not even the kingdom of heaven. He knows what they're talking about, but he's saying you really don't understand the kingdom of heaven. He says the kingdom of heaven agreed before the foundation of the world that the Son of God would become as a man to pay for the sin debt of man that man could not pay himself and become the lamb slain before the foundation of the world. Why? For the kingdom of heaven. For the Father's will to be performed. Then he turns to his disciples. And he says, The days will come when ye shall desire to see one of the days of the Son of Man. He doesn't say that you'll desire to see the kingdom of heaven. Right? They were going to be the ones that were starting the ministry of fulfilling the Great Commission. 
They were the ones that were going to be scattered to and fro. They were going to be involved in the kingdom of heaven. He didn't say you're not going to see one of the days of the kingdom of heaven. He says you desire to see one of the days of the son of man. He says and you shall not see it. He says you're going to desire for it to happen in your lifetime and he says it's not going to. Right, you know when the Apostle John over in the book of Revelation wrote, Even so come quickly, Lord Jesus? Jesus has already told him, you're not going to see it, John. But even though in that John in the flesh wouldn't see it with his fleshly eyes, he says, Lord, come as soon as you can. He says, I can't wait to see it. But Jesus tells him, he says, this is, this is after y'all. Some of them, were martyred before the completion of the even word of God. In fact, all of the disciples except for John were. All the apostles, they was off the scene. What happens by the time the book of Revelation is written? Many others that weren't disciples and weren't apostles, they're off the map. They didn't get to see one of the days of the Son of Man. What's that when he comes up and sets his millennial reign? But you know what they did get to see? They got to see a whole lot of the kingdom of heaven. You telling me Stephen wasn't fully invested in the kingdom of heaven? He didn't get to physically see in his carnal body the rule of Christ in the millennial reign. But you know what he did get to see? He got to see the son standing at the right hand of the father ready to receive him. He got to see the work of the Lord take root, take shape. He was one of the deacons of the first church. What are you saying? He had God all over him. He was invested in the kingdom of heaven. So the first thing is that you've got to delineate between the two. The kingdom of heaven is something given on the inside by the Holy Spirit. But the days of the Son of Man, that's when Christ comes back and sets up his earthly kingdom for a thousand years. But, he says in verse number 23, they shall say to you, see here, or see there, Go not after them, nor follow them. He says, anybody that says, hey, I he's coming, I figured it out, he's over here. He said, mark that joker as a liar. Don't even waste your time. We know that when it comes to the rapture of the church, the Bible says that no man can know the day or the hour. Not that no man does know, it says you can't even comprehend it. He says, if you can't even comprehend when God's taking the church out of here, how in the world do you think that you've got the ruling reign of Christ where he sets up his throne through the thr throne of David? But where's that at? It's not around no more. So where's he going to get it? He's going to find it. And what's he going to do? He's going to sit on it and fulfill the promise that God made all the way back in the beginning that he would through Abraham, then through Isaac and Jacob, that they would be the vessel to deliver the Lamb. And that that lamb would sit on the throne of his father, David. Then you really want to blow people's mind. Go to the last chapter of the book of Revelations where it says that he was the root and the seed of David. He was the beginning and the end. David didn't have anything to do with it. He just picked David as the vessel. He was the root. What's that mean? He started it in the ground. But he was also the seed of David. You know what that means? He was the finished product too. It was all him. He just chose to use man. So you really think that you're going to be able to figure out what he's doing behind the scenes that he's had planned from the beginning? I don't think it's going to work. He says, if they say we got to figure it out, take it down the day and got to figure it out. Never learning, never able to come to the knowledge of truth. But he says, but first... He, referring to himself, the capital S Son, must suffer many things and be rejected of this generation. He says long before Jesus can ever come back, there's much he has to suffer. Does not your Bible tell you that even today the only reason that he hasn't wiped the world off of the map is because of his long suffering. He's not just talking about the marks that he bears in his physical body. Right? Those 
nail prints. That spot where they thrust him with the Spirit. It's not talking about those things only. He suffers every day, not for your sake, not for my sake, but for the sake of a lost and dying world so that they might have one more opportunity to come to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. He bears the suffering, allows it, accepts it, embraces it, just like he did on the day that you got saved so that you could fall under conviction one more time and let the Holy Ghost draw you with cords of love and kindness to what? To confession, repentance, so that you might be a part of the kingdom of heaven. But it says also rejected by this generation. It was foretold that he would find no place among his people. The prophet's not without honor except where? In his own country. He came into his own and his own received him not. He's foretelling that right here. He says, I know what's going to happen. Well, who are the gentlemen, these disciples that he's talking to? What are they a part of? They're a part of the generation that he says they're going to reject him. He says, this generation's got to reject me and they got to go off the map. But they're like, Lord, we're part of that generation. He says, yeah, that's why you're not going to see with your physical eyes. One of the days of the Son of Man. He says, God's got a whole big plan to this. Don't worry about it. It's all going to work out in the end. He says, and as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be also in the days of the Son of Man. Now, we know that before the millennial reign set up, eventually we're going to get to this timeline. But seven years before that, we know that the church is raptured out. But see, he's talking about his second coming. He says that before Christ comes and lands on the Mount of Olives, when they're gathered together in the Valley of Megiddo, Right to finally wipe out the nation of Israel for one last time. Hey, we got them all this time. No escape. Backs against the wall. He lands on the Mount of Olives, splits it in half. Then it says that he rides down, a sharp two-edged sword comes out of his mouth. The blood of the shed and the slain comes up to the bridle of the horse. You say, how that's possible? They're in a valley. Possible to retain liquid. He says, the days of the Son of Man. Before that, it's going to be like in the days of Noah. Not talking about the rapture. I've heard that misquoted a lot. It says it's in the days of the Son of Man before the second coming. It's going to be wicked continually. Everybody's saying, well, there's still some hope. People out there aren't completely wicked. Doesn't say that they have to be in order for the rapture to happen. You know all that it takes in order for the rapture to happen? The father to look at the son and say, go get him. There's people that have been taught things, that they've heard things throughout the years. Somebody misremembered, somebody misquoted, somebody misapplied, and they're not true. Why'd that happen? Because the people that were being taught didn't know the Bible as good as the person trying to teach them. Now you're saying, Brother Jordan, you mean that I should know it as good as you? I'm saying if you've been saved longer than me, you should know the Bible better than me. You've had more practice, or should have had. That, that was one of the reasons that I let the flesh beat me up when the pastor first asked me to teach this class. There's people been saved in here longer than I've been alive. There's people in this room that have been a member of this church longer than I've been alive. Lord, what am I going to teach them? Right? That's why I don't get up here and try to teach the most profound thing. Every now and then, Brother Bob and I have real profound conversations. It's usually over real simple stuff. But you know what it is? It's somebody that's read the Bible for a long time. He's just saying, hey, let me show you what the Lord showed me today. Or, hey, I was out in the woods the other day, and I saw this. Or I was picking up rocks around my, uh, my yard. He gave me one. I got fossils still sitting right on my nightstand. It's one of them old fossilized shells. And he said... Isn't it amazing to think that that was formed when God turned the world upside down in the flood? I said, yeah, this is a little crazy. What happened? I went home, I thought about that for a while. How'd that happen? He was just thinking about the things that he's learned over the years. God showed him something new. But that should be the case. 
But it doesn't say that it's in the days of Noah. That'll be the days of the rapture. No, that's when he comes back and he finally shuts the door of the ark and says, everybody that's got in has gotten in. He's coming back for the 144,000 and that's all that's getting in. No more room for anybody else. The ark was filled up. And what's he doing? He's coming back to save those 144,000 Jews. What's it going to be like on that day? It's in the days of Noah. Evil, their thoughts continually. Solely given over to possession and domination by what? The mark of the beast. The thoughts of man on this world cannot wholly be given over to evil with the presence of the Holy Ghost still around. Well, as long as the church is here, guess what? The Holy Ghost is here. Because he ain't pulling out until we pull out. Because again, the kingdom of heaven is what? It's in you. Why? Because one from the kingdom of heaven embodies you. Just giving you a little shock and all. We'll get into it more next week. And the week after that, and who knows how long we'll be here. Until we get it done. But it says, as in the days of no, so shall it also be in the days of the Son. They did eat, they drank, they married wives, they were given in marriage. Until that day that Noah entered into the ark, and the flood came and destroyed them all. What's the battle of Armageddon going to look like? They're going to be having a feast. They're going to be shouting. They're going to be shooting rockets up into the air, celebrating, saying, hey, the war's finally over. We won. Until what? Until the raindrops start falling. Till he rolls back the sky and then we come back with them on white horses and then they realize, oh, the ark's already shut. They bought it, hook, line, and sinker, giving themselves wholly over to the Antichrist agenda. And they finally think they've won. What did they think in Noah's day? That they had it all. They thought Noah was an old crazy man. They don't even know what he's building. He says it's an ark. What's an ark? We don't know. He don't even know. You ask him what an ark is, and he says, I don't know, I'm just building it the way God said to build it. I said, how are you supposed to trust a guy that don't even know what he's doing? But for years, Noah preaches righteousness. What that, dude, that guy don't know what he's talking about. Until what? Until one of them felt a little drop on the end of their nose, and they looked up and said, huh, what's clouds doing up there? Then another one fell, and another one fell. And then eventually God broke up the waters in the deep. And what happened? The whole place was flooded. What are you saying, Brother Jordan? They thought they was having the time of their lives in Noah's day, and they're going to be thinking, we finally got everything that we wanted. Until what? Until they hear whatever it is that's going to come out of his mouth. A sharp two-edged sword that's going to cause them all just to... It's just like in the days of Noah. But it says likewise. Also as it was in the days of Lot. They did eat, they drank, they bought, they sold, they planted, they built it. See, you don't eat if you're not hungry. But why are you hungry? Because he was still working. He was doing something. You don't just get hungry from sitting around doing nothing. He says they eat. Then they drank, they bought, they sold. Why do you buy? Because you think you're going to use it. Why do you sell it? To get more money to go buy things that you want to buy. Where are their thoughts? Their thoughts are on tomorrow. They're not on today. Because they planted, they built it. You plant expecting it to what? Grow. And then to be harvested. You build, why? To use says that their thoughts continually are on what's next, what's next, what's next, never upon what is now. They had angels walk in the city and they did, couldn't even perceive that those men were from a different world. The men of Sodom and Gomorrah came out to Lot's house, knocked on the door, hey, let us get to know them. That knowing full well that they weren't talking about having a meet and greet. They couldn't even perceive that those men were something that the world would call righteous. Were they holy? No, because they weren't God. 
but they were angels from God, dispatched from heaven. You say, well, God could walk right in front of me and I'd recognize it immediately. You sure about that? You got the blinders of this world on if you're focused on tomorrow rather than today. Today is the day that the Lord has made. We've got documented events all the way through. There's two fellows that were saved on the road to Emmaus to go down there and preach to people. Jesus just snuck up on them. It says it didn't, his words burn in our very heart. Yeah, if somebody starts talking and the inside of my bones start burning, I'm going to think it's a little bit different. They just kept walking like there's no problem. Till what? Until he broke bread and gave to them. I like Brother Bobby Cato's illustration on that. Why did it take it for him to break the bread? Because when he took the bread and he broke it and he served it to them, they could see the nail prints in his hands. You say, is that Bible? I don't know, but it sounds real good. It wasn't until he revealed himself to them, but they said, man, we should have known. They're kicking themselves. In fact, they're so excited about it, what happened? They'd already made it about a day's journey away. They hightailed it in the middle of the night back home to tell everybody. They said, well, hey, we saw him. They said, we should have known it when we heard him, but we saw him. But so many people throughout all of history thinking that they had a handle on what God was doing. You're going to tell me that God could walk in front of you and you'd recognize him? Only by the grace of God. Only if he let it dawn on you who he really was. They thought in their day, well, surely we'll know if something's up. They missed two angels walking into the city. You'd have thought that would have been, hey, uh uh-oh. You boys know how that crazy guy out in the middle of the fields called Abraham keeps preaching about righteousness and God and Lot. We know he's righteous. We know that he knows the difference between right and wrong because we made him the judge of the city down there at the gate. He says he had some visitors that didn't look like normal visitors. Maybe they know something we don't know. Instead of inquiring Lot, what's happening, what's going on, no, they were still only concerned with what? What they wanted. But it blinded them to what God was doing. Look at the next verse. But the same day Lot went out of Sodom, it rained fire and brimstone from heaven and destroyed them all. Not only didn't they perceive that the last righteous man down there in the city departed the city, being dragged by two angels from heaven, didn't care. They was focused on tomorrow, making sure they did today in order to get what they wanted tomorrow. And what happened? Fire and brimstone fell and they was none the wiser until they were gone. So shall the days of the Son of Man be. They're going to be thinking, what are we going to do next after we wipe Israel off the map? Hey, after all this, we're going to divvy all this up. We're just going to take a piece of that. We're going to have this. We're going to be, everything's finally going to be peace on earth. Till what happens? Till fire and brimstone falls on them. It says it, what, it destroyed how many of them? All. Not one escaped. It says in that day, verse number 30, or 31, sorry. He which shall be upon the house top and his stuff in the house, let him not come down to take it away. He that is in the field, let him likewise not return back. He says on the day that the son physically returns, on the day of his second coming, he says if you're one of the ones that he's coming for, Don't even worry about packing your bags. Don't worry about running back to your house. He says, if you're in, you're in. But if you're not, there's nothing you can do. Referring to the rapture, it says the two will be in the field. One will be taken. One will be left. One will be saved. One will receive destruction saying if you even knew who it was don't you think you'd want to hang around with the wind inside he says it's going to be right out there brother sister father mother he says they're going to be separated 
they're not even going to know the difference. But, verse number 32, he says, Remember Lot's wife. But God turned Lot's wife into a pillar of salt so that Jesus could say that. Why did she turn back? Because she chose to. But why did God make an example out of her? So that Christ could tell you to remember Lot's wife. What did Lot do? Lot told him, don't look back. What did the angels tell Lot? Don't look back. Everybody knows, don't look back. Now, I have never experienced nor seen the wrath of God poured out on the world. But I can't imagine it would be loud and I can't imagine that it would sound as if God was tearing the whole world apart. Because in truth, that's what he did. He poured out his judgment on the world. And his judgment does what? Rejects anything that's not holy. That includes the earth that was under it that was cursed by sin. Why do you think they'll never be able to find Sodom and Gomorrah? Because God wiped it off the map. Nothing left to be found. They poured fire and brimstone on it. I don't know what that sounds like. And I don't know what it's like to leave all those daughters and sons-in-laws inside of the city knowing that what you're hearing behind you is being poured out on them. And you're wondering, I wonder if they heeded and they, tur they finally picked up and they finally left. I wonder if they're following behind us. You say, what'd she turn back for? I don't know. And I can't ask her. But you know what I know? She turned back. That's why she was turned into a pillar of salt. Right. And I know that God wanted it to remain. It wasn't just something... Well, if they're not allowed to turn back, how do they know that she was turned into a pillar of salt? Because after God's destruction was done being poured out, they came back for her. And they found it. How'd they know that God turned her into a pillar of salt? He left it there as a reminder. A strong one. How do you say that? Because Jesus is referencing it thousands of years later. Remember that pillar of salt. What's that pillar of salt to remind you of? It doesn't matter what's going on behind you. If God said, move forward, move forward. If God said, you don't need anything in that city. You don't need anything in that city. Double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. Imagine how much more a double-hearted man is. The Apostle Paul said that he was torn between a decision. It was after God had revealed some things to him. He said, I don't know if I want to go or want to stay. But you know what? He was facing the same direction in either one. He's still facing Christ. He wasn't double-hearted about it. He says, hey, I got a glimpse of what's on the other side, and y'all, I want to go. He says, but I also know that it's needful for you that I stay for a little bit. He says, but whether I go or whether I stay, I'm wholly sold out to God. He wasn't double-hearted about it. He says he was torn between the two. If God said, which one you want, Paul? He said, well, Lord, I love being a part of the kingdom of heaven and working down here in your ministry. He says, but I also got a glimpse, and I know it hadn't even entered into the heart of man. Well, you've gone to prepare. Because you love us. He says, I ain't got an idea what's truly on the other side, but he says, I can't wait to see it. Amen. You know what the difference between that and Lot's wife is? The Apostle Paul was always moving in one direction. How could he say that, Brother Jordan? Because he fought a good fight and he finished his, face, or finished his race. There was a course in front of him and he walked it from start to finish. Can't do that if you turned around. Not saying you're always moving at 100 miles an hour, but I'm saying that you put one foot in front of the other and you finished what God set you to do. What did Lot's wife do? She rejected what God wanted and she turned back around. And in that moment, she didn't feel the fire and brimstone that God poured out upon it. But in a moment, turned into a pillar of salt. What did it look like? Salt. 
Does it matter? He left it there as a reminder. You know what she was worried about? Lot's wife was worried about yesterday. Because she turned around for the things that she had yesterday. Her family, her house, her lodgings, her possessions. She turned around for the things that she had started. It's a crude illustration, but let's say she started crocheting a blanket. Well, I'm going to need that blanket up in the mountains. What did she turn around for? Yesterday. In the days of Noah, where were they looking for? Tomorrow. In Lot's day, where were they looking? Tomorrow. And you know what it tells me? It doesn't matter where you go in human history. It doesn't matter where you go with the plans of man and all the desires imaginations that man can come up with everybody's looking everywhere except where today you know why they're going to miss all the signs of the rapture because they're not looking at today you don't know why they're going to miss all the signs of the second coming of Christ because they're not looking at today God since the beginning has been whom? The I am. Where's God at today? Today is the day that the Lord hath made. God hadn't made tomorrow yet. He made today. And when he finished yesterday, it was good because all things that he does are good. That means he ain't going back and dealing with yesterday again. God's always with where? Today. Today is the day that the Lord hath made. We shall rejoice in what? Be glad in it. You know the critique that I find of those of the world, they're always looking everywhere except where? Today. Because if they took a good look at today, they'd realize that it takes an all-powerful, all-knowing God to keep everything on its course. They'd be without excuse to look around at everything created and not know that it wasn't created by anything else they could see. That it took a divine hand in order to orchestrate everything around them. But why do so many people miss it? Because they're either looking at yesterday or they're looking at tomorrow. They're not too interested in today. They want to get through today to get to tomorrow. Or they want to slow down today so that they can re relive yesterday. Not knowing that today is the only day that they got. Tomorrow may never come. One of the major deceptions of the devil is what? To shift people's focus away from anywhere except where? Where they're at. Because if they took stock of where they're at, they'd realize that they were poor, wretched, blind, naked. They had nothing. But yet they've been deceived into thinking that tomorrow they can be something. Or if they could just get back to what they were yesterday, they'd be better. You are what you are by the grace of God. And you're not worse off only by the grace of God. Let's take a look at today. Shortly, if we were to go through all of the things leading up to the rapture of the church, which marks the beginning of the tribulation period, the last prophetic act, as our preacher talked about not too long ago, is the catching away of the saints. But there was one right before that, that in prophecy had to be fulfilled, that hadn't been fulfilled. That was the return of Israel as a nation to the promised land. Well, when did that happen, Brother Jordan? I don't know. What do you mean you don't know? Oh, no, I know when man signed the piece of paper and said Israel's a nation again. You really think God cares about the date on a piece of paper that man made? I don't know what God's requirement is to call a nation a nation again. I don't know how many of those that have been scattered had to return before God said that they were a nation again. I don't know when God ordained it and said, all right, Israel's return. But the world will tell you that in 1948, Israel returned to the Holy Land. And then because of some of them bozos that we talked about that thought they knew the Bible, that didn't know the Bible, a bunch of them said that Jesus is coming back in 1988 because the prophecy is that a generation shall not pass away 
from when Israel was created as a nation again. Well, they read in the Bible where a generation was 40 years. But that was true at a point. So they started saying Jesus is going to come back in 1988. They missed that one. You go over to the book of Psalms where God, through Moses, extended a generation from 40 years to 70 years. Well, where's that put us on the calendar, Brother Jordan? Well, if God decided to work man's ignorance and use man's calendar on whatever day that man said Israel became a nation again, that puts you in 2018. We're still here. But what's a generation? Well, I don't know when God started the first generation after the nation was founded. The ones that founded it, they're a part of a different generation. When did God start that generation with the clock? I don't know. But he said that if you live over 70, you're blessed. He didn't say that all generations stop at 70. He just said that it at least takes 70 after it was founded into a nation. So considering that you don't even know the clock that God started, when he started it, or how much overtime he's put on the clock, why? Because he chose to. Because he chose to be gracious, to be long-suffering. He said it was required that the Son of Man would require suffering. You know what's going on in glory today? The very Lord of Lords and King of Kings suffers, not for your sake, but for the sake of your loved ones that are still lost. He puts up with the enmity of sin in the world and the insult against His righteousness and His holiness. And He resists, He chooses not to wipe everything off the face of the earth for their sake and for your sake to become involved in the kingdom of heaven. But even 2018, you know what that tells me? That for five years, every day, you've just been living off of the grace of God. Tomorrow is not promised. Why? Because everything's been fulfilled. Yep. For 70 years, you could at least say, well, it's at least going to take seven years. Go read. He said that a generation shall not pass away. He could have come back whenever he wanted to. He didn't say that 70 years had to be fulfilled. He said that generation is not going to leave before I come back to get them. Well, you saying, Brother Jordan? Man's thought they've had it figured out for a long time. Remember Lot's wife. Don't look back to yesterday. Well, I want to be what we once were. Be what God wants you to be today. Remember the days of Noah. They thought they was having a good time, but what? They was buying, they was selling, they was marrying, they was planning for tomorrow. But they find out tomorrow don't matter when you don't make it through today. Remember Lot's wife. As we go through this book, showing you things on the end times, the timeline, things that we know are going to happen. The order of events. When's it all going to happen, Brother Jordan? No idea. And if I lose my mind and tell you the date that I think it's going to happen, guess what that means? Mark it down, that ain't the date. Because I promise you, God ain't coming back on that day. When's he coming? Soon and very soon. How soon is soon? Well, what all you're working on is today. Today's pretty soon. John thought he was coming back real soon because he said, even so come quickly, Lord Jesus. Which is a hard thing to imagine when you've just seen everybody that's going to be in glory and knowing that you've never seen that many people in your entire life, let alone everybody that you've known has never known that many people. How many were up there? There's a bunch, go count it. All the th times thousands and thousands that he saw as a great multitude out of every nation, it says. Amen. Why does the tribulation go on as long as it does? Because God knows that there's some that are going to choose to reject the mark. Guess what? They're going to get in. They're going to get in different than you got in. 
but they're going to get in the boat. What's happening? God's leaving the door of that boat open long enough for what? Every last one of them to get in. And then what? He's shutting the door on the ark. Christ is coming back and splitting the Mount of Olives in twain. He says, just like a lightning strike happens over here and it makes the light shine all the way over in that part of the sky. He says, it's going to hit and it's going to be a quick impact. Everybody's going to know that it happened. Well, how fast is the rapture going to happen? Moment twinkling of an eye, it says. How quick is that? Quick. It means as soon as you can even perceive it, it's already done. What are you saying, Brother Jordan? I'm saying there's a lot of people that thought that they've got it figured out. You know what I've learned studying this book? We ain't figured anything out. The only things that we know are what God has allowed us to understand. The only thing that we can wrap our heads around are the things that the Holy Ghost has led and guided us into the truth of understanding. Well, what's He want you to understand? Don't look at behind you don't get focused on tomorrow focus on where the master has you pulling that plow today look at the field that you're in and consider what labor is needed for today why because the fields are white on the harvest but the laborers are few there's a great feast ready for any that'll come and we've run to the highways and hedges why so that the master's feast may be full the fact that he hadn't come back because everything has been fulfilled because everything in the eyes of man right, has gone the way that God has said and we're just living on grace you know what that tells me there's still more room at the table because if there wasn't he'd have shut the door already he'd have called us out of here the Holy Ghost would have been removed and then man's thoughts can turn to their own carnality without the presence of God hindering the evil machinations of man's heart. That's what's going to have to happen and have to get to evil continually. But if you're looking for evil continually to point to people and say, hey, the rapture's getting ready to happen, we're gone long before evil continually. Because that can't happen with the Holy Ghost still here. This world, the only thing keeping it from going into utter chaos is the fact that God's presence still permeates the globe. When's it going to happen, Brother Jordan? Don't know. But I know that when it does, there's going to be those that aren't ready. Because if the fellow on top of that house was expecting it, he'd have had his things packed with him. And if the fellow that went out to the field knew that he was coming, he wouldn't have gone back to the field. It says, don't turn around and try to go back. It's too late. He wouldn't have left whatever was so important for him. Lot's wife knew that they were leaving, and she still wasn't prepared. How do you know that? Because she turned. Well, let me just... Too late. You say, you think it was really her turning around that caused her to turn into a pillar of salt? No, because long before she turned around, her heart was already looking backwards. She finally gave in to that desire, what it cost her. Everything. I honestly believe she knew that there was nothing left in God's judgment back there she was looking to see if anything else came out of that city hoping that something that she was wanting to see would be behind her and what she find she found nothing I don't care if you're looking at what's behind you or you're trying to see into the future and what's ahead of you you know what you're going to find nothing because it is no more yesterday it's finished Tomorrow hadn't happened till what God makes it. So why don't you just live where God has you now, today? Whether it comes back or not, it's always going to be worth being concerned about the Father's business today. Right? That is our primer into the end times. Next week, I don't know when, we're going to bust out some slides on the projectors back here.
because I got to give you visuals because if I tried to draw it all in the sky with like a you know laser light or something y'all look at me like I was crazy but I don't know how deep we're going to get we're going to get as deep into it as God wants us to get into it but remember through all of it Lot's wife because Christ said that was worth remembering said remember in the days of Noah how they didn't care until what? Until it was too late. Then they cared much. Lot's wife thought turning around was worth it until what? She couldn't turn no more. She just turned into a pillar of salt. Left there as a monument for, of what? Don't turn around for the things that God said you don't need. It's always right to obey the Lord. Why does that matter, Brother Jordan? We're going to talk about some things that are coming. One, to instill into you the fear of what's going to be for those that are left behind. I you can't be right with God. Read what's coming and want to leave anybody behind to face it. I truly believe that. I know that some will be left, but I don't want it to be the ones that I know. I don't want it to be my neighbors. I may not even like them, but I like them enough to know that they don't they don't want to be involved in that. Three and a half years, it's going to be okay. And then what? It's going to get bad. Then it's going to get worse. And then they're going to be cast into the lake of fire. But if you know what's coming, he said, don't worry about it. You don't have to look at tomorrow. I'll tell you exactly what's going to happen. Why? So that you can stay focused on today. So remember Lot's wife. Did you know that IBC is now on iTunes, TuneIn, SoundCloud, and Google Play? Head on over to your podcast provider and subscribe today. And as always, thanks for listening.